We must save the magic turtle sword. I want everybody to take a second and think. When was the last time you went and picked an apple from a tree so you could have a snack? When was the last time you went and raised a cow to have that flame in your own to celebrate the big deal you just closed at work? When was the last time you went and picked wheat, ground it into flour, and baked it into bread so that you could have a sandwich? Chances are most of you haven't done any of those things, and that's okay. I haven't done most of those things either. But take a second and think a little deeper and ask yourself, what is the common denominator between each one of those scenarios? It's the soil. Healthy soil creates a sense of wonder when I think about it. I mean, we know so little about how this stuff actually works. Not just we as in us, normal everyday people, but we as in the scientists and the experts that have been studying this stuff for their entire careers. It's only really been in the last few decades that we begin to discover why the magic of the soil has been able to support all of life on planet Earth. Scientists have classified thousands of eating soil types all over the planet, each perfectly evolved for their specific ecosystem. We've got Temperate rainforest, seasonal rainforest, evergreen rainforest, semi evergreen rainforest, boreal forest, annual grasslands, perennial grasslands, prairie steppes, deserts. There's a lot that we can learn from all that diversity. Yet, we've approached farming like nature's got it all wrong. Of the 318 million acres used in the US to grow principal crops, over 71% of that land is grown on three crops. Just three. <coughs> We have this responsibility to be looking at all this diversity that's out there and using and implementing that into our farming systems. Take a look back and see how this conventional farming paradigm of plow, plant, harvest, repeat, plow, plant, harvest, repeat that we've been using for the last couple thousand years has actually worked out for us. The Fertile Crescent of uh, Mesopotamia used to be where agriculture and civilization were born. The land has been plowed there for over 5,000 years. Yet, when you look at the region of today, what was once the cradle of humanity has now become an ecologically and economically unviable war zone. And looking a little less back at the Roman Empire, they saw massive amounts of deforestation and erosion from poor agriculture. The soil that was once fertile became degraded, and the reliance on imports grew. Eventually, the growth of the empire was too much for it to keep up. And this theme is not uncommon in our history. Neolithic Europe, ancient Greece, Mesopotamia, Central America, China, colonial regions of the world, and the American Midwest. The, the Dust Bowl was brought on by drought, worsened by poor farming conditions, overclouding of fields that's bare between seasons. It affected over 100 million acres nationwide, including a large portion of that here in Texas. Daily losses peaked in 1936 at $440 million a day in today's value. And the wake-up call for us Americans didn't come until some of that soil that was lifted thousands of feet into the air blew hundreds of miles away and fell into people going about their daily lives in New York City and Washington, D.C. There's a theme between all of these farming systems. Large farms based off of monocultures relying upon tilling, using annual crops, leaving soils bare, disturbed, and without diversity. And sure, we don't have a dust bowl anymore. That's good. We can pat ourselves on the back. But looking at a 2007 report from the National Resource Conservation Service, a branch of the USDA, the erosion rate in America is still 3.8 tons per acre per year, which is the equivalent of filling up that bulge like a bus full of soil and just driving it straight off the farm. That rate hasn't changed much in the last 20 years either. It's still 10 times faster than soil formation. For us Texans, it gets even a little more fun. Go change out the keys for that Volkswagen bus for that dump truck, because the average here is 8.8 .8 tons per acre per year. Humans have made disruptive impacts on our planet throughout history, building empires far and wide. Just like this ripple, eventually that impact subsides. Much of what was changed returns to its prior state. And that's not to say we don't make significant impacts every time a ripple occurs. But one thing always remains true. Disrupted, disturbed, and degraded farmland is fragile. So fragile that it can expedite the decline of an empire, even among the greatest of greats. But I'm not up here to harp on the problems. This is TEDx. I'm here to talk about the solutions. We can have a blank slate. We have the solutions now. And the solutions are in the soil. As a biology nerd, this is where I get really excited. For the soil, it turns out that the magic is in the biology. Let me give you a soil biocrash course. Everybody knows that plants photosynthesize and use sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to create oxygen and sugars. 
However, most people don't know that over half of those sugars leave the plant through the roots and go straight into the ground and eat microbes. In fact, one teaspoon of healthy soil has over one billion microbes. Now, why in the world would a plant want microbes around its roots? Well, for this very same reason that a city needs a whole slew of professions of people to make it work, the soil needs a host of different biologies to make the soil work just right. Some of the microbiology serve as the doctors and the nurses of the soil protecting the plants against pests and disease pressures, reducing the need for harmful chemical pesticides. Some of the microbiology, bacteria, and fungi serve as factory workers, turning raw materials from the soil and the air into plant-available forms of fertility, reducing the need for expensive chemical fertilizers. And a specific type of fungi are muscular mycorrhizae. They work part-time on the factory floor making nutrients, but they also have a side hustle as plumbers. They tap straight into the plant roots and help pipe in hard-to-reach water reducing the need for irrigation, and increasing drought tolerance. Water is a big deal nowadays. That's important. Those higher up on the food chain, just like any other food chain, police the populations of those lower down. And in fact, they create a waste stream in the process. Not a big surprise. But unlike cities, this waste stream turns into something beautiful and beneficial. It turns into something called soil organic matter. If the microbes are the people that make the city work, then the soil organic matter are the homes and apartments for those people. It prevents erosion, it holds nutrients, and it acts like a sponge for water. We should have about 6 to 8 percent of it in our soils. Yet, the current farming paradigm has driven those numbers down to the 1 to 3 percent range. And that's a huge bummer, it's a problem. Just 1 percent of the stuff across an acre of land can hold as much water as a backyard swimming pool. So, needless to say, we should be doing everything we can to prevent and protect and promote this biology. Using something called regenerative agriculture, the focus is just that. Can you guess which side the regenerative principles are used on? Probably don't even need to say it. Fields like this one on your right are what having higher organic matter and biological activity in your soil. Author Michael Pollan once said, eating is an ecological act. Every time we take a bite of food, we play a role with our dollar in deciding what type of farming college we want be promoting, what type of farms we want to be promoting, what type of farmers we want to be promoting with that dollar. To make this connection to ecology a little bit simpler, think about this. What forests do you see that we go lay down fertilizers in for the trees to grow? What mountaintop meadows do you see where people are spraying with pesticides? We don't have to do these things because over millennia the systems have evolved the means of self-regulation. And the more that we manage counter to these ecological principles, the more we end up making our fields like, look like this one on your left, increasing desertification all over the world. And sure, this is a field showing a pasture for grazing, but the same can be said about farms used for uh, growing crops. Okay, so regenerative agriculture is good. What does it actually look like when it's implemented? This beautiful farm in North Dakota is 5,000 acres, and it's a display of all of these different principles. The first tenet that they use is you need to keep the soil together by reducing and removing tillage. Tillage breaks up soil biology, which takes years to settle in just right. It's kind of being a, analogous to being a spider and having your web ripped apart each time you're almost done building it. How much you feel that before you get to the They haven't tilled their, their, their fields in over 20 years. And the second tip, you need to keep your soil covered. You can do this using something called cover crops, which help prevent erosion, build fertility, and soil organic matter. This farm never has a bare field thanks to cover crops. And third, they use something called biodiversity. You need to keep your soils diverse. Biodiversity creates strength and resilience in the face of pressure. This farm uses eight different cash crop species and 22 different cover crop species. And that's some serious biodiversity. And for the business heads out there, I mean, farming is a business. You need to put food on the table, pun intended. You can look at this farm and see that it's 20% higher yield than the county average. It's a 65% lower cost of goods sold. They don't have to spend money on these expensive inputs, and that allows them not to have to take government subsidy, which is completely unheard of for grain farms on scale. Seems like this one will never happen on the farm like the one in the previous example. This water should be soaking in, used by plants bit by bit in dry times, yet it's eroding soil. The farm in the previous example was able to maintain 14 inches of rain in a 24 hour period any erosion. Okay, so the fourth tenet, you need to keep your soils fertile. Makes sense. 
This vineyard uses animal rotation, cheap and alpaca to maintain their fertility. Kind of like those fancy automated lawnmowers, they help manage some weeds around the vines, but these sometimes come with an attitude. I don't know if you've ever tried to dodge an alpaca spitting at you, but I have, it's not the funnest. This farm in Greece was a degraded hillside, clear cut and deforested hundreds of years ago for farming. They used cover crops now, which we talked about before. And this millennial group of farmers is literally growing a blend slate of their own if you get farming this land. Okay, so the fifth tip. You need to keep your plants in the ground. What does that mean? Well, using perennial plants, you can plant it once and it'll grow back every year. Annual crops will replant it. This decreases costs related to planting, and it decreases the disturbance of soil biology. This farm uses something called agroforestry. It's a 6,000 acre farm in Brazil. And agroforestry allows them to grow apples, bananas, mango, guava, even corn and eggs from their chicken. You can grab all that in one pass. And this land was once said to be too sandy for farming. You couldn't farm here, not possible. But regenerative agriculture has proven that wrong across 6,000 acres. And these tenets, they're a good description of what it means to be regenerative, but they're by no means a definition. These are just patterns we see across farms, really doing right by ecological processes. Okay, so we need to be really using this up everywhere, my belief. The population of the planet is, is, is quickly approaching 8 billion people, and we need to be protecting the, the surface of our land. 40% of it is agricultural land. We need to be doing everything we can to protect. But unfortunately, the rate of erosion and soil loss leading to farm land loss is at a rate of 59 million acres per year right now. 59 million. That's the size of the United Kingdom. And that's a huge problem. These losses are completely unnecessary. Completely. And if I haven't convinced you that by now, we can all get a little bit more excited. I heard someone's building a rocket to Mars, so we can all, you know, jump on board. Any takers? Okay. If you're still on the fence about space travel, Here's one more example for you. The Atlantic rainforest was one of the most biodiverse ecoregions on the planet, but 85% of it has been clear cut, much like this. But this land was taken by an ecological farmer, turned into something beautiful, 1,200 acres of it reforested, no soil erosion, soils rebuilding, and all 17 streams on the property flow year round again. <coughs> the land is part of the most biodiverse and fertile regions of the, the Atlantic rainforest now. And in fact, the cacao that he harvests from this is of such a high quality that it's some of the most expensive in the world. This works ecologically and for business. Regenerative agriculture is beyond empowering, in more ways than just how it interacts with the soil. Regenerative ag allows us to build uh, healthy systems and, and grow more nutrient-dense food that's healthier for us. Research out of the University of Texas has shown that over the last few decades, that nutrient content of our produce has slowly begun to decline year over year. And that's a problem. Regenerative agriculture restores the health of the soil, nutrient content of the soil, meaning healthier foods. Farm systems that rely upon regenerative agriculture empower their communities by keeping money local and rebuilding those local economies. In fact, no joke, there's a regenerative ranch out in Georgia and they employ 152 employees and a town with a population of 102. But this is not the normal scene in today's farming America. It's not the typical farmer Joe that you see on this tractor with his family and farms anymore. Depression and suicide rates are at the highest that they've ever been in these communities before. And this is directly attributable to the huge six and seven figure production loans these farms have to take out every single year just to stay in production and maintain these high costs. Yes, farming is supposed to be hard. We've all heard that. But no, we're not supposed to have empty food. We're not supposed to have crushing debt. And we are definitely not supposed to have higher suicides in these communities. These people need us. We've only been on this planet for the blink of an eye. And to use a favorite analogy of mine, if the Earth were 24 hours old, we've only been here for one second. That was one second. That's how long we've been here. And in that one second, we've only known one farming paradigm. Plow, plant, harvest, repeat. Plow, plant, harvest, repeat. Sure, there have been changes here and there, but it would be crazy to think that we got it right the first time in that one second. We have a responsibility to be observing these ecological processes evolved over millennia, observing, learning from, and implementing these into our man-made systems. 
regenerative design expert, Rob Dolman once put it, we're on the cutting edge of 10,000 year old technology. Except now we have the, the pleasure, the, the privilege to be applying all of our sciences to bridging this gap between man made and natural systems. So, yes, we do have the solutions now, and we can save the magic of the soil.